Thanks very much for the invitation, and thanks all for coming. As Ian Rabba introduced, my work is, I am used to present myself as somebody working in critical security studies and international political sociology, with an interest in migration as the field to which I try to think conceptual, methodological, and political issues in relation to security. So what I, tomorrow I have a workshop, but I have heard that's a closed workshop, right? Uh, on securitization and security. So I'm, both told, I'm not going to talk so much directly about security, but I'm going to come from what I've been trying to think through, what does it mean to come through the security and migration nexus from outside of security, while nevertheless talking about security, just to make it more complicated. So what, but what that means is that the question I'm going to ask is what I refer to and will develop as giving conceptual primacy to movement, how that actually gives us some analytical purchase, critical analytical purchase possibly, on engaging with the security migration nexus. Yeah. What that means is that I'm not going to interrogate the security, the links between security and migration from critical security studies as such. The way critical security has been trying to be critical about this and do critical analysis of it has been from very different many angles, but the lineage I come from has tried to show how this nexus actually comes about to social political policy processes. So it's never a given that is there. And the way they do it is then is they develop, they draw on various different kind of approaches. I'm sure those of you who do securitization know these, but I'll summarize them quickly just to say, to illustrate where I will come from. Um, one element is, of course, through the discourses and the speech acts that are done, which often leads that one singles out particular groups of actors who speak. But you can also do more free-floating discourse analysis where you just build sources, put them together, and see how is migration emerging in relation and in connection with security connoted or denoted uh, terms. So there is an element about how it's then reproduced and repeated. Other approaches come through identifying less through discourse, but more through <coughs> a set of professionals. So how do you see securitization? Is when policing, military, military intelligence, certain forms of surveillance and so on become mobilized in the management of migration. So you can start seeing this if we would be an entity, a policy unit, right? And suddenly half of us, not suddenly, but half of us are working in the security sector. You can start thinking the policy development is securitized because these people, are present, and then you can start analyzing how present are they and how do they weigh on these decisions, right? That's, all the, that's also an approach that's been taken. Another one in the same lineages where you try to be, show how it's a social political process is where you work through technologies. There's a lot of interest in border technologies, surveillance technologies, registration technologies, all kinds of technologies through which migration becomes managed that has somehow some connotation or link to what people see as policing, for example. Uh, again, so the policing sits very much and the, the military sits very much in the background. Now, that, that's called critical because it makes the process of rendering the security migration nexus contingent upon social and political process. So it's not like there's an inevitability because we suddenly have about you know, 100,000 people at the border, that therefore it needs to be securitized. That's the question I said. No, how do we come to reading the numbers as constituting and supporting the security migration nexus? Those you work on securitization notice, that would be an analysis that comes from trying to understand how security works. Right? How is security practiced? How is it distributed? How do imagery and so on of security circulate in society? Some of what I will say will be linked to that, but what I am interested in as well is that how can we come to this in an analysis where we don't make security central? Which is a paradoxical question for if you come from security studies, because like any discipline, you know, if you're in migration studies, you look at migration, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have security, you look at security, so you center the world on security questions. How do you come from the outside to that, so that security can emerge in a more open world? 
And the element that I'm experimenting with at the moment is to come in it and rather than taking security as central to actually come to the security migration nexus, to take conceptualizations of movement, not just migration, although I'll talk mostly about migration today. So concepts of movement. How certain conceptualizations of movement actually play out and make security emerge in particular ways in, and make the security migration nexus emerge in particular ways. But the movement itself is broader. And I'll try to illustrate this. If it's not clear, you know, we have a Q&A, so you can actually do that. And if you disagree, then we can also do that in the Q&A, of course. Uh, good. <coughs> so, if I come from movement, I'm going to introduce three concepts of movement. You know, I will switch between motion, mobility, movement, but don't worry too much. I don't make sharp distinctions between this. So I'll, I'll try to speak just movement. Yeah? Three concepts of movement. And one of them I will connect to the primacy of movement, and if we have time left, I'll also indicate how the third one leads to particular modes of counter-mapping as a critical practice and intervention on the security migration also. Good. So, the first one is very simple, we all know, but it's nevertheless important to repeat, I think. This is border, not in border studies. It's the idea that the world is understood to be contained by sedentary units of it. Whether they're states, they can be cities, they can be villages, but what organizes life is the village, the contained bordered unit. And we have several, you know, or we have a border between the rural and the urban. And these contained units, so I'll take the map of the world, so we have the sphere the map, right? Means that movement means then crossing from an outside or from one bit to the other. Now that's a self-evident way of understanding movement, maybe, but it is a peculiar. This is why lines of division and separation, territorialized lines, become so important in the way uh, problems, movement, they don't have to be problematic. You can also trade the scene from one country to the other country, for example. The movement of migration from the rural to the urban. It's a sedentary conception of politics and the social. Right? It's bounded. Now, that brings a particular view <coughs> on migration, which we're all familiar with. It's that migrants come from the outside somewhere to the inside. Most politicized at the moment, in, at least in Western Europe and so on, so I am most familiar with the European Union and so, is of course that this moves from one country to the other. But historically, and also in other areas, Equally important is the movement from the rural to the urban, for example. It has been very important in the 20th century beginning. This end continues being important. But you see, you move from where, somewhere where you belong to somewhere where you then arrive. And you cross a border or a separation. Now, here, the securitization of migration emerges on the back of this. As I said, it does not necessarily have to mean, because there's a lot of migration that is not doesn't emerge as a security question in this context, right? But there is an imagery that is reproduced on the back, an imagery, which is not just a visualization, on the back of this understanding of movement. And that one, I've illustrated here, for example, is why there is actually not only the symbolic presence and the symbolic value and validation of wall building, which is a strong image, you know, you cross a line, you know, remember I said it's the line that separates, that defines the movement, because you need to cross a line. So the, the walls are actually kind of strong image of how it is. And that's mobilized, of course, very strongly in the securitization of migration on various sites that we can go into. But it also represents itself cartographically. This is a map from Frontex, they usually do, which is where you actually set up a territorialized entity and you just have anonymized kind of arrows from the outside to the inside. This is a very strong way in which you can sustain the security of migration nexus through this conception of movement. Because it's always from the outside to the inside, but these are so similar to any military invasion map that we use. Anyone who's done military history or strategic history will know these maps. 
is also what you will continuously find if there is a war going on in newspapers. If they try to map a war, you know, you could use this map if there is a, some armies here and they're moving into Europe. So there is an element, but it is dependent on this particular conception of movement, right? That the territorialized unit is closed, is enclosed, and something from outside moves in, right? So that's one conception of movement, which is quite central to upon which and security emerges, security migration actually emerges in a particular way. Into that one. Now, <coughs> I'm sure there are other examples you can come up with that reproduce and show not just how this kind of understanding of movement actually materializes itself in other things than basically walls. But the walls, there's a lot, there's a whole political economy of walls. I don't know if there's anyone here studying these things, but it's fascinating how many walls are being built currently in the world, right? We have also this one, which is a networked conception of movement, right? Where movement is not the crossing of borders. So I want you to look at, oh, you can't see it very well, because you need to see the lines, but take this, the dots are anyway most important here. Don't do this one immediately, yeah, because there's a, usually a practice where networks are overlaid with the geographical, cartographic map. Anyway, so they, they can be brought back to my previous imagery, almost, right? But as a concept of movement, where it's not border crossing or crossing between two spaces that are separated by a line, networks function differently, right? Networks operate <coughs> where you move from point to point. And it's not the external boundaries that define the movement. It's the movement where you actually jump. Drawing, I draw heavily on Tim Ingold's work here, not just in networks, but in the three concepts of movements I present. Right? But you can say, in some way, Tim Ingold speaks called this transport. You can also speak about logistics. When you do logistical analysis, you often do this. Right? You don't go literally from, oh, we go from Trump to Niger. No, you go like, what are the logistical lines along which, whether it's goods, capital, people move, right? From hub to hub, that's important as well. Uh, <coughs> so what's so important, so you actually, if you just look at this and not that, then point of origin and destination are not what runs the network in some way. Of course people are on the move, goods are on the move, but you're trying to come to you know, the densities between the points, so the thicknesses of the lines about the number of people moving, for example, or goods and so on, but also the smoothness of the moving or the frictions that they place are central, which is not about border crossing necessarily, it's about differentiating, not who can come in and who cannot come in, right, that's the legal image. It's much more about who can move fast or slow, for example. There's been a lot in, for example, those who are familiar with the literary autonomy of migration, this has been one of their major arguments that basically the fortress Europe or any fortress imagery does not work what they then replace it with something like a sieve or something, because what, what the discrimination, but what they actually do is, and say what really matters is, most people will go in, come in at some point, but it's more difficult, and they're slowed down for some, they're kept, for example, in hotspots, hot and then they can move further through, but they're slower, which is different from when I travel, I just move through, right? If I migrate, however, there is again the difference is how easy can you get resident permits, work permits, and so on. So the, the differentiations are made in the speed which the ease which you can move between places. But the network metaphor is a different conception of movement when it's taking place. So important as well is that the lines are just the thicknesses of densities of movement. It's possible you can also map speed, I guess, if you want to, uh, for certain groups of people. But Nobody is interested in the lines in a network. At least not these in migration. You're interested in jumping from here to here, and then from here you can jump to there, and from there you can jump to here or there, in this case, and so on. So what matters are indeed the dots on here. How you can move from dot to dot. 
What happens in between is generally not so important, except that ideally in a logistical transport understand you want to move as frictionless as possible, right? And you can then see that security becomes entering, might enter, and gets a different meaning rather than border crossing and controlling and patrolling the border, a line of separation. It becomes a controlling of an element of the speed and the smoothness which you can jump from point to point. Right? Now we know that as well. It means that, for example, the security practices you start looking at here are not the walls, for example. Walls are not so important. They might be important, but they have an outcome about a policy that creates, tries to create friction for certain groups of people. Right? It tries to slow down, make it more difficult for you to jump from point to point. To some extent, you can say that the destruction, which now, you know, I don't know what in Poland is currently central to how securitization of migration is done. In the UK at the moment, it stopped the small boats. In Libya, destroy the little boats that come. It then makes it ever more precarious, of course, because you, it's not that people do not come, but the boats become less safe, it becomes more difficult, it becomes more expensive, and so on. So you actually, in some way, it doesn't matter whether it's Libya, Tunisia, so you just take a point where you destroy it and make it more difficult so people get locked into that point and it becomes more difficult to jump to the next point in the network. Yeah? So that's a different conception of movement that's taking place. Why this is, of course, you can easily say, well, Jeff, that's fine, but they are connected anyway. That's why you overlay them on a map, right? Because, you know, why there is a destruction here, for example, is because, of course, they don't want to do what was in the previous map. Yeah. They don't want these arrows to come. But I think, analytically, it's important. Sorry. It's important. That's a diff this is a different anal analysis of movement. And I think it draws attention to different security practices, which are about controlling networks. Right? Which also plays out, in my understanding, in the migration area. And therefore, the security migration nexus appears differently. I come wide. Do I speak about movement? I'll come to the next one. It will be clearer in the next one. Why do I call that coming from the outside to security? Is that I hope you can see that I start from not a conception of the security practices and the security technologies and security professionals, but from a conception of movement, which is broader, right? Which is also, you can see a play. I mean, these networks, network metaphors understanding, play very, as I said, in logistical analysis, international trade, you know, capital movements in international banking, and so on, they're there as well. So this is a more broader conception, but that you see playing out in connection to migration as well. And the security elements emerge, that emerge and become visible, are different. Managing networks is to some extent different from managing borders, right? And both courses. Good. Now, you could say that doesn't offer much criticality, which I agree with uh, these two. Because these are at the heart, but I'm correct or not, but that's what I would argue. These are at the heart of at least the very visible security kind of techniques that are presented publicly, but also the way one thinks about movement and how to control movement. Yeah. So what I want to do now is take a step back and make a very abstract point in a second. That there is an other, what I call giving conceptual primacy to movement, is neither of these two. It's a different conception of movement. It's a conception of movement that takes movement as always going on. There's no end, no beginning, right? The movement keeps on going. It's, and the movement is continuous. I'll come back to this. Let me take an abstract point about this. This is a kind of, this is some literature that's going on. That's thinking, in which it's become very, in the context of mobility studies, for example, but it's not all mobility studies, but even one, in which one takes as a point a starting point that what's referred to as a Lucretian line of thinking movement. Lucretius was a Roman kind of philosopher, poet, who has been picked up through the ages at several occasions. He was very popular with the post-structuralists, some of the post what we now refer to as post-structural French philosophers at some point, 
with some of them, right? But what he said is that all phenomena are moving. So what underlies being, as well as nature, human being as well as nature, organic and non-organic, is that things move. Everything is movement. There's no stasis, no static points. The imagery that's being used of this from the atomist, which is that, you know, if everything can be movement, so if things fall down, it's straight lines, of course there's no relations. Things just fall down. But that's not what happens. What happens is that the falling down, there's all what they call a glenamen, which is the smallest angle through which you move, to which there is, so it's the smallest angle that turns a straight line into a curve. Once you have curved lines, they move in relation to one another. So we have relations. But there is the element that the vortex and everything falls, or moves like this, whatever it is, right? But they also you need curves because otherwise we have no social. It just goes down and there is no connection between them. Yeah. So that's the absolute point. It's more than the atomists in the Greek philosophy, because the atomists retain the, the atom falling down. What Lucretius does is saying, at least in the newer interpretations of this work, is that the atoms themselves are consistent of movement in itself. So you have to take, which is very awkward, you can't think from a thing, although we all are, we always tend to have to speak about something that falls or something that moves. But you have to start thinking about the line of movement, the curves itself. Because also the atom is a circling upon itself of things moving. It's a very abstract idea, but I think analytically what it means is that we don't think in terms of things, but then everything moving. Right? It also means for, and that's our Ingold's quote. Ingold is an anthropologist, I don't know whether you're familiar with Tim Ingold's work, but if you're not, he is an anthropologist who has been thinking quite a lot about, you know, revisiting life and the conception of life as movement, in this case, but also in other ways within anthropology. So it's not, it's part of that movement in anthropology where you try to think beyond having to think within some closed bounded communities that you're going to study. Right? How do we get rid of our field, which usually is a community, a bounded community? So he says that. But he says, it's still the essence of life that it does not begin here or end, the final destination, but rather that it keeps on going. That also means that the line he draws, although it's a curve, a curve line or something, yeah, it's not important where it starts, where it begins. That makes it different. Oh from this one. Oh sorry, you can also do this one. Right. Often migration is, you know, we see, you move from one place to the other and that keeps, and there's a lot of literature, how then as a migrant you're bound and locked in being, being at home nowhere and in both places, right? And what that actually creates. So it keeps, so the point of essence, that point is not important. But the other bit is that, <coughs> so what he says, life is lived along the line rather than across them. And that makes it different from this one. Because as I said, what matters here is the point, jumping from point to point. This kind of thinking, what matters is this line. But this line can never be a straight line. It's the, the life that happens in the travel, let's say. Right? So it would be in tourism, for example, to get out and to, to in a different field, it would mean that what matters is not so much that I leave London on the plane get to Warsaw and now I'm here and I'm going to do my touristy things and visit the museum, the places, the pubs, whatever I want to visit there, and then I move back. It would be a tourism where me moving from London to here, that part is core to the touristic experience that's there. Because it's what happens on the way that matters. That's also, that's why this is different for them from networks as a conception of movement. And you can see as an anthropological notion of movement, there's also a physicalist conception of movement and the recreation element. So there is also an element about how do you move this into much more bigger scale kind of things rather than the human experience of travel or of movement, for example. But I'm not going to go into that route. But the important thing is that you can actually almost summarize it in two ways that A, the lines are not separators. So it's not a circle that separates an inside from an outside. The line of movement is therefore not crossing from an out to an in. Neither is it this, or 
That's why I hate slides. I need more. I need kind of slides that stay. Um, <laughs> it's needed this line, right? Which is which is a line, but the line what happens matters us, and it's a straight line. The line that matters is a line of meandering that actually doesn't. You, you start somewhere, you know. When you tell a story, I'll come back to that. You start somewhere, and then you follow the journey a bit, and that's it. Right? So it's a different line. So it's not that line, neither is it the straight line of the connecting of points. It's a line like this. First. That's how he symbol, how he represents it. And that means that movement is continuous. In both these other conceptions, movement is discontinuous. You, because you jump from one place to the other, or you jump from point to point. Right? Uh, and so there is no continuity of movement. And this concept. I've got a bit of time, it's good. What that leads to is that <laughs> we start thinking about not networks, not moving between self-contained units, communities or so on, but you think in terms of pathways, the movement becomes, a, and for Ingold it's important then that it's an inhabiting of the earth. What he means, I mean, this is a complicated idea, I guess. But very simple for, for when I think about migration, it means that people are on the move and they inhabit the space through which they move. So there's an element about dwelling in the movement. So coming back to my metaphor of tourism, you know, my or you have said sometimes in walking tours, right? It's not when you, well, you start and get back, although you might want to start somewhere and get back somewhere, of course, but what matters is the experience you have while you walk and dwell and how you're exposed to things while you walk, that's to nature, that's to the city, and so on. You meander through it. So it's an element about moving as inhabiting what he calls the earth, but that has, but you can call space. <laughs> and so the lines are the lines along which people move. Uh, and so what matters is experiencing and being exposed. Of course you have then all the elements, so we have I use this image for that. But there is also this image, which is <coughs> the element of how you present movement is not necessarily only yours. You can also have different people or animals and people or whatever, natural flows and so on, moving in relation to one another. And then they become entangled. Right? So they, they move into one another. So you can walk along a path every day, but somehow that part, although you might geographically walk the same line, the encounters you have with other things, whether it's the wind, the flow of the rain, other people that move through, and so on, differs. So it's repetitive, but also different every time. Because it's the exposure you have through moving in relation to one another. I hope you see that it's different from the point to point and from the inside to the outside. Here it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The inside and the outside. I'm talking about different conceptions, right? And this conception of movement is not organized around the inside or outside. Let's see. <coughs> and I think then I'll do the next slide. Yeah. Is that more or less this kind of conception? If not, then ask me after that, because I want to very briefly do how this actually change how you see this at play in certain practice of countermapping just to have countermapping migration as a critical practice towards how the security migration nexus is produced. Uh, and so this one, so these are images that you could actually see from there, but this image is important. That's an image again from Tim Ingold. I think he is, he is brilliant in terms of bringing out because of the way he does it with lines. Uh, and visualize it. You see, you can say that's like a network, but it's not, right? Because these are not points. These are the lines crossing and circling around another line. So there's an entangling of lines that's taken place. So you cannot this understand this. You can understand this place, but what, but again, if you see, it's the moving through that matters, right? Rather than the point. And the point again. And although he has from these elements, these are just taken 
not as a starting point, but that it shares actually with networks, is that the outer boundaries don't matter so much uh, of this place. But it's the way, and he speaks of meshworks. I mean, there's different terminology, for him, but he speaks of meshworks. And therefore, you can't do the same cartographic uh, presence. And so you can say very briefly, and then I do 10 minutes, 5 minutes of counter mapping as an illustration. Say, so, okay, we have this, but what does that mean? For how? Because security emerges from this. I think in these stories, security will emerge differently. It emerges in the encounters. And you will see this in migration studies. There are people who actually do, you don't do the maps, you don't do the insight, you don't do the technologies as such. You actually go and follow migrants as they move through a space, or a space they create by moving through it. And then they have all kinds of encounters. Now, if you are a very critical analysis, we'll then start focusing on violences, precarity, and so on. But migrants have all kinds of encounters. But you see, the insecurity elements can emerge. They often emerge from the humanitarian element in this kind of analysis, where one follows migrants, one builds narratives about the journey that one takes, the meandering. But of course, at certain points or moments, there are violences that emerge. There's an encounter with the police, for example. But there's also an encounter with the shopkeeper who sells stuff. There's an encounter with activists to help, and so on. So the lines, the activists move into an area, you know, the baker moves around, you will say it's static, but you know, bakes his stuff, and so on, and so on. So you have these camps, so you have an element in which security emerges in a different way. Through the lived experiences, if you want to, and the exposures, of the different people, things, flows, and so on, that work in relation to one another. I think it's a different form of how insecurity emerges. All three that I've presented do exist in the literature. Right? If you do migration literature and studies, and I don't know what you all work on, but you might have that diversity here as well, right? Where people and combinations of this, of these. But what matters for me is that there are three conceptions of movement, and this one. I would like to present as giving us some leeway and opening up from coming from security studies that I said in the very beginning, where you tend to focus on security technology, border technologies, and so on. Right? This one opens up because it becomes it becomes more complicated if you take it serious. You cannot just study the exposure to the border, the exposure to the police post, and so on. You need to have multiple exposures within which security therefore emerges, but also in a diffused, decentered, distributed way, in connection with others. For me, that's it might not be so important for you as migration studies, but coming, that's a conundrum for security studies always been in areas which was played out, it doesn't only play out in relation to mm -hmm. migration, also in global health discussions you have this and so on, but migration has been a particularly important area because of the human, humane, humanitarian, strong, elements to it. That if you come from security, you actually try to tend to focus all the time on the security technologies and practices. And therefore, these lines miss out a lot about what is happening. And therefore, you could write stories, analytical stories, I don't mean stories just making up, you could do that as well, analytical stories in which security can emerge, but without necessarily organizing this kind of spatial rendition of movement, right? And so I think they open up for that. Now, I don't have much time left. Uh, but I hope this makes a bit sense where it comes from, how it's a different take on the security migration nexus than at least what I'm used to. I'd be glad to hear how you come to this. One of the elements where you can see this third conception of play is, in the move of counter-mapping. Counter-mapping is a practice that are seen as, you know, some variety of representation method. They're also methodological processes, of course. It's how do you map, right? They can be mathematical, they can be, they can be narrative mapping, and so on, that are done. But in which you actually try to question the dominant spatial knowledge, through which, in this case, migration is rendered, presented, circulated, visualized, however you want to call it. The maps I had before of the network, as well as the arrow stuff, they are cartographic kind of renditions, if you want to, or not cartographic, 
geographical or spatial orientations, yeah, against which counter mapping often works uh, as a practice. That's what they're critical about. Right? And there are there are different definitions of counter mapping. I mean it's it's a quite it's a relatively small but also a relatively big field. It's a bit paradoxical to say, but there's been a lot going on in counter mapping, particularly in migration, but also in indigenous relations and you know the, when land becomes important, it's also important how maps are done and histories are that. But there are two I wanted to talk about here, which I think are connected, and they're in different ways connected, to the third conception of movement as this kind of dwelling, pathways, meshworks, meandering, and so on. The first, what you find in counter mapping, is often that one says the geographical maps and the network maps are devoid, devoid of humanity. There's no human element to it to some extent. Although that's not fully correct, but to some extent there is no human life is basically very abstracted. So what do we do in counter mapping? We need to find a way of breaking how cartographic maps and network maps, which are mathematically rendered, to bring the human life as in a life experience, exposure, and so on into it. Right? And then you have a humanizing movement where you try to disturb the limits or show the limits of cartographic and network mapping, the mathematically rendered mapping of movement, by bringing in the human elements. Now that sounds very simple. I'm sure you've come across some of these maps. This is a map like this, where you take the story and the narrative. So it's a combination of narratives, of telling a story of a journey, and somehow mix it with something cartographic, like this journey. And so one tries then to build in experiences, right? This may sound pretty straightforward, but this is very interesting on the sorry, I'll get out of the way on the mapping thing. <laughs> I, if you want, I can. I mean, these are not mine, right? I draw literature on counter mapping. I can send you some of this stuff if you want to, just as references, if, if that would be helpful. Uh, so it might sound, like, but there is quite a bit about that. When you narrate a story of a journey, the way you understand space is not the same when you represent it as you would do in a mathematical cartographic and flat way. Because you can be in a space, you might not tell the space like, you know, I first was here, then there. You might say, oh, something happened here that actually shocked me, and then there was some very nice experience here, and then you go back, oh yeah, and by the way, here I took the bus, right? So the, the time element, and so on of narration and the way you structure and construct the journey is different from how and there is a tension with how you do it on a cartographic map. But what they do try to do is you can see they try to bring in the human element, but in doing that it's not straightforward how that is done. So then hence there is more to this than say, okay, let's map the journey onto a map. So you get, I know you know these probably have seen this as well, where I'll ask people to draw their own journey uh, very often. The various. But what I want to bring out is not a straightforward thing, because it really disturbs there's a tension between narration and cartographic mathematical mapping, the geographical mapping, that's all. And you could do say similar things with regard to networks. Right? So that's one form. And I think this, of course you can see, is closer to I didn't do this on purpose because then I thought this image. This, I wasn't doing counter mapping yet. <laughs> I, I don't do counter mapping, I wasn't looking at counter mapping yet. So, but it's very similar to something like this, <coughs> the way it's drawn, much more so than the other ones. So I think they draw and have an understanding where they try to bring this conception of movement inside a cartographic rendition in a different way than, for example, the overlaying with the network is done, but in some way it's similar as well. But it's a different kind of story and visualization, circulation that moves. I know I've run out of time. Can I? I'm going to use one more minute. I don't have a picture for this one. By the way, on the previous one, there's a very good, but I'll circulate this. I mean, you know, Van Houten, several people have written on this, but Van Houten and Quinn uh, Olassi have a very interesting piece that summarizes this how that actually connects to, you know, humanizing, mapping more mobile people, and then. As a way of their argument is really we should not let go of, of maps. Because out of my previous one, if you're on the third movement, you say, let's get rid of the network analysis, let's get rid of the cartography. But they go like, 
No, we need to hold on to the cartography because it's a very powerful tool as well to politicize, to circulate, to analyze, to visualize, and so on. So we, we wouldn't want to necessarily get rid of it, but we need to do it in a different way that it disturbs to take for granted quotes. Martina Tazioli does something different. She says, if you look at migrants, right, it's very difficult to follow the movement of a migrant all the time, because it's a very diffractive people it pop up and become visible, for what that, because there is a, a bit of a, a hunger strike going on, she is interested in contestation and struggle particularly. Because they're registered, but then they go. So you can go and talk to them and see, and then they disappear. So migrants don't stay in the same place when they're on the move. They're also sometimes moved about as part of government, right? So when they destroyed the jungle in Calais, the people were put on the bus, but they knew they would come back. But at least, you know, you, you move them around so they can't stay and build for a while. So you will keep on moving them. So her idea is that if it's a diffracted landscape, then there is a criticality. How do we bring that out? Because you can't, you don't have these arrows. You don't have, what do you mean, these small kind of entanglements, but that's it. You don't know where the, line, the lines continue and where they come from, necessarily. You might have stories about where they come from, but you know, and so you have these spots, so you get a very diffracted conception. A fractured conception, you can say as well, or fragmented. Or for example, Europe, where the geographical element doesn't hold, because you only have let me go, some moments of entangling. Some of these bits you have, right? And that's what we have. But if you start representing that, then the cartographic unity that's given to Europe should actually not be there. Right? The migrant's presence is a continuous presence, but a discontinuous presence. They're always there, but the way you actually map them, present them, tell them. And she, therefore, this is a move what she still uses counter mapping for, but it's a non-cartographic -map, non map. It's an element about how do we bring together this information about some of these meshes. Mm -hmm that emerge. And so one of the elements you could do is, since she is interested, you can do it in different ways. Right? You could also do it through, you know, some people, how they actually emerge in a certain space, right? You know, in Andalusia for a while, at the coastal area, or maybe in the village, they stay in the hotspot, they're there for a while, and then move on. You could do these small bits that are there. But she is interested in struggle. Politics for her is about struggle, activism, protest, and so on. So she actually would say there are moments where the migrants become visible. You see the mesh works emerging in struggles. So you could start thinking, not about mapping them, but about building an archive of these instances. Which between them, if you read through them, there are lines, right? The archive is connected because you might have a line, someone here, and then this person pops up here along the line again, and you have these bits and pieces. And it's open to call it counter mapping. Because in some way, it's a different conception of mapping that is less cartographic, because it becomes locating. But it's based on these lines, where there are certain entanglements that pop up, and you don't need to have a continuity of these entanglements. It's not that you have, like, on sometimes that, so you have a struggle here, protest there, and protest there, and then you start connecting them by seeing, for example, how certain activists were here, and then train some people here, and train people there. No, you can actually just let them emerge through the very entangling that's there in the protest mm -hmm. and so on. Does that make sense? That's a different way of representing, which cuts again, I think, in these struggles, there will be security issues at play. Very often, there are. But again, you do not reduce the element through the studying of the security, like how the security is done and emerges and starts structuring this particular spot, it becomes part of what is a contestation, a struggle that's going on, which has more dimensions to it, if you want. But not an infinite dimension, because it's a happening, it's an event that takes place, right? Within which there are certain entanglements are there. And that's another form of counter mapping. And I think the third conception of movement is what I call the conceptual primacy of movement, what you could call this recreation line of thinking of movement, opens up and underlies some of these. And I think the Tazioli one is much more radical, analytically radical, than the other one, which is humanizing, because the human, but that's also the project of the humanizing. You, take the, you keep the cartographic to some extent, 
uh, as well. But it often still, when you do narration analysis and so on, people still see migrants as coming from one place and coming from the other one. Right? Which is here as well. But I think there is a difference between these two. And I'll leave it at that. So that's what I wanted to bring. Right? So that coming to the different conceptions of movement, how that lets emerge. The security <coughs> question and security practice in a different way, but also these centers from security practices by you know, looking at movements and then you have to conceptualize things a bit differently. Also, in a way it would be coming from migration to security, not that from security to migration if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'll leave it at that and see if there's any questions. <laughs>